Okay, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we will have guest lecture. Uh, we will discuss about climate change from the United States. I would like to introduce Professor Nathan Haltman. Uh, I will read the short bio uh, after this, but this is the cooperation between um, the LPM and MPKP, uh, the Master Program in Economic Planning and uh, Development Policy. Uh, we would like to, to have uh, Dr. Professor Haltman uh, to share about climate change. But before that, I will read the short bio of him. Uh, so Professor uh, Haltman is the founder and director of the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland and professor in the School of Public Policy as well. Professor Haltman's work focuses on developing and assessing policy strategies to target and achieve ambitious national climate goals. Uh, this includes U.S. emission mitigation policy, rapid coal phase-out strategy in diverse national contexts, and economy-wide emission strategies in key countries with a focus on China and others. He was recently senior advisor in the office of the uh, special, special Presidential Envoy for Climate at the U.S. Department of State, where he led the writing of the 2021 U.S. Long-Term Strategy Report, and also helped negotiate the U.S.-China Joint Glasgow Declaration at COP26. Uh, from 2014 until 2016, Professor Haldman worked at the White House on the Obama administration's climate and energy policy team. And during this time, he helped develop the U.S. 2025 NDC, supported uh, bilateral engagements with China and others, and participated in the international climate negotiations in Paris. He has participated in the U.N. climate uh, process for 25 years, uh, starting with the Kyoto meeting. So Professor Hartman is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and associate director of the Joint Global Change Research Institute, a collaboration between the University of Maryland and the Pacific Northwest, Northwest National Laboratory. He was formerly a visiting fellow at the University of Oxford and a Fulbright fellow. He holds an MS and PhD in energy and resource from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA in physics from Carleton College. So uh, today um, he will discuss about climate actions in the United States from national to an all-in strategy, uh, not to um, postpone the time. Uh, please, Professor Hartman, you can uh, start doing your lecture. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Johanna. And I do, I do want to thank everybody uh, for joining us here, uh, both in person in the room and online. I see we have a number of people on Zoom. Um, so uh, basically, I am, uh, first of all, grateful for the chance to be here at the University of Indonesia and to uh, meet some of you here. Um, it's, it's uh, I think, an incredibly important moment in uh, working on climate change and energy transitions right now. And I even noticed looking at the wall here that your mission is to cultivate future leaders who are social responsible and able to address global challenges, which I think this is uh, one of them. So um, excited to have uh, the chance to speak a little bit more with you here today. Um, so my talk, I think I'm going to have to ask the technical team to advance the slides since I don't know if that I have a clicker uh, myself, but there we go. Okay, so we've got We've got that. Why don't we start? So today we have a, um, I think what we can do is I have a lot of slides because I wasn't sure how big of a room I'd be speaking to, but since we're, we're a little bit smaller group today, we can have a little more conversation. So please do feel free to raise your hand if you want during the discussion and, and ask a question. I know we will have some moderated time as well, but you, please feel free to, to ask a question if you'd like. Um, the other thing I will do just to kick us off is, is maybe just to go to the next slide. 
Okay. Tell you a little bit about the University of Maryland and our center. So I'm, as, as uh, Professor Johanna uh, mentioned, I'm uh, the director of our Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland. Uh, we have a few people in the room who are also at the center, and, and I thank them for joining us, us here as well. Um, it's, it's a relatively uh, large research group that we have working on climate and energy issues, both at our center and in our, uh, some of our other collaborators at the University of Maryland. Um, the University of Maryland, for those of you who don't know, is in the Washington, D.C. area. So we're about four miles from Washington, D.C. boundary ourselves. Um, and then do do a lot of work, as you heard from my introduction, uh, working in and with our, our U.S. government uh, people. So um, th I've been in and out of government myself, and I think that that informs a lot of the work that we do, uh, try to help, help understand what, what we can do in the United States. And then also, um, as global citizens, uh, all of us, what can we do to help uh, kind of advance well-being for our people around the world as well as uh, for the planet? So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, so so I think I don't have to dwell a lot on this first co concept, but it really is coming down to, I mean, the talk today will be centered around the topic of climate change, and I don't want to kind of say that is the only problem that we need to be thinking about, but it's clearly like a critical and central global challenge as we try to think about how we minimize the risks to people around the world of a of a, of a of a warming climate. And I think that this talk will not be about the science of climate change. It will not be trying to convince you that global 1.5 degree trajectory is the right target because lots of other smart scientists and policy people have already worked on that and decided that 1.5 degrees of warming is the goal that we should all be aiming for because that's the goal that will keep the risks as low as possible not zero, but as low as possible. And this is what this slide is essentially saying. So we have to figure out how we're gonna, where are we now? What, what do we have in place today as countries around the world and where are we heading based on our current trajectory? The short version, of course, we all know is we're not all doing enough, like in the US and Indonesia, everywhere else, we need to do more. So how do we do that? How do we do it in a way that makes sense for our own countries, for our people? That's the central question that we as a research community you guys as students, people working on this topic now and in the future, will be needing to think about and think about quickly. Next slide, please. Um, so this one is just a, a short slide. I think I'm gonna actually spend less time on this one than, than otherwise, but some of you may know there's a whole set of international negotiations that happen around climate change. The central point of this slide is essentially to say, that is a critically important part of how we as a global community will address climate change, but it's important to note that's not the only venue, right? So the kind of international discussion, a lot of what we needed out of that discussion came out of Paris, right? Like we have a kind of architecture that we can use to deal with discussing the problem with ourselves in the global annual meetings called the conferences of the parties. And there's always gonna be some discussion and frankly, there's gonna be some disagreements that happen at those international negotiations. But it's also important to remember that's not the only thing that happens. And so each country is doing its own work. And I think one thing I wanted to highlight because Indonesia is hosting the G20 this year is that there's these other forums that happen that are outside or kind of related to the international discussions that happen under the framework convention. And so the G20 is a theme that I'll just hit on a lightly a couple of times in my talk today, because I think the G20 is a critically important forum. And I think Indonesia's leadership in the G20 has been important and will be important as we kind of get to the conclusion of that in a, in a month or two. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so so again, I'm, I think I'm just, I have a lot of slides, so I, I will go through this one somewhat quickly. Where are we now? Where are we now with climate? Um, last year, 2021, was a good year for climate. Um, things have been happening. And I've been, as you heard from the introduction, I've been in this kind of discussion, you know, for 25 years. And, you know, that, my first climate conference was in Kyoto. It was 1997, which probably sounds to you guys like a very long time ago. <laughs> to me, it doesn't sound like that long, but it's still long. So a lot has happened since 1997. And honestly, we are in a much better place on climate change than we were even 10 years ago. And there's a lot of reasons for that that I won't go into right now. But I think that I want to kind of note, we're not starting from zero, like we're not sort of stalled, like the world is doing things on climate change. And I think we should, you know, recognize that and get some energy from that, because we are actually doing not too bad. Now we do need to do better, but like things are happening. And so what I wanted to note from this slide is that 
a lot of countries have now put forward very ambitious climate targets under the Paris Agreement that if we deliver on them, will actually go a long way toward helping keep us on that 1.5 trajectory. Honestly, 10, 15 years ago, if, if I had said this, a lot of people would have been like, no way that's ever going to happen, right? It's happening. So we are doing it. So let's take some heart from that. We are doing it, but more needs to be done. So this is essentially what this is saying. A lot of countries last year put forward these more enhanced, nationally determined contributions or climate targets, um, but, but we still need to do more. So next slide. Um, good. And then at the COP itself, we at the climate conference itself, we got a few good outcomes, like some good outcomes on negotiating language around 1.5. We also had some good things happen out of the side uh, sort of dimensions of the conference. Like I was, as you heard, involved in the US-China negotiations. That would, there was sort of a mini breakthrough on that, although that's now put on pause because our countries remain having some difficulties together. Um, thank you, please welcome, come on in, please come in. Um, so so uh, basically we did get a number of other um, dimensions of progress at the climate conference, including the US-China work. We also got work on methane, which was sort of an unusual thing that many people hadn't really focused on as much. But methane might be a really important part of how we as a global community uh, can keep on the 1.5 trajectory in the next, say, 15 years. And so I can return to that if people are interested, but I'm just going to put that out there for now. Next slide, please. Okay, so where does that leave us? And so this is a paper that I and some other people, including a couple here in, in, from our CGS team were involved in uh, from, from a, about a, less than a year ago in science that show our NDCs collectively as a global community are getting us partway to where we need to be. And you can see like a little circle on the slide there, which is sort of where the NDCs are gonna be. But you can also see that a lot more will need to be done very rapidly after 2030 to get us onto a 1.5 degree compatible trajectory. Now we don't need to go into the great detail about that right now, because that's an interesting scientific and modeling question, but I just wanted to show you that based on the NDCs, we're kind of getting there. In fact, I could even show you here on the slide, it's, it's a little bit small, I'm sorry for the guy on the camera, because I'm gonna be walking around a little bit, but um, you see here, we've, we've gone from like sort of the business as usual part of the trajectory you know, and then by 2030, it's actually pushed it down quite a bit to there. And now we need to kind of, after 2030, really keep going and go much faster. So more of the same and accelerating more of the same. That's the main lesson there. And there's a lot of interesting things here, which I won't have time to speak to, which essentially are showing that the probability of our reaching under two degrees now is increasingly, is, is increased quite a bit since just a few years ago. So again, that is the good part of the story. We have actually made dramatic improvements. We, we may well be able to keep under two degrees at this point. That's tremendously, tremendously important and helpful news. That said, there's still a lot just to be getting to two. And then again, our science people tell us repeatedly that even 1.5 is probably uncomfortably a lot of global warming. So we need to keep working toward getting there. Next slide, please. This is just another version of the same story by a different research group called Climate Action Tracker. And they're a great group if you wanna kind of follow this stuff both at the global level and it's sort of looking at individual countries. Climate Action Tracker is based in Germany, but they do a lot of really nice work and is a go-to source for a lot of governments uh, around the world. So I would recommend that if you ever need to do a quick check on where countries are and where they're going, that's a good place to start. Although I have to say, I have some small quibbles with it, but it's largely good. It's largely the right. Next slide, please. Um, actually, could you go back one? Because there, there was one summary statement there. So three parts of the story that I wanted to highlight that are just on the slide. We have made good progress, which I just mentioned previously. We are not yet on the 1.5 trajectory. And keeping 1.5, quote unquote, within reach is still possible. So that's another important part of the story. But I have to say, barely possible. It's, it's very difficult to stay on 1.5. We're almost too late to, to kind of do that. But don't give up. Next slide. Okay, so then where does that leave us all today? So basically right now, um, we are in the position where the, the scientists tell us on the global basis, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. But ultimately remember the UN process, the framework convention process has essentially no power. It's only a, it's only a venue for countries 
to come to and then offer what the countries are willing to do on their own. And of course, they can each try to influence each other and apply pressure in various ways. But in the end, it's all about what the countries want to do. So what the US wants to do, what China wants to do, what Indonesia wants to do, et cetera, right? So ultimately what this boils down to is that we've made progress, but for us to make more progress, the countries have to decide to do more, right? Each country has to think about what it can do and then crank up to whatever they can do, right? That's not saying everybody has to do the same, but it's saying everybody has to look at what they can do and then try to maximize that. I think that's the right way to look at it. And so what this map is showing you is just that there's there's a lot of differentiation. And I think I will say one of the more sort of uh, uh, normative or values laden statements that I will make today is that some countries are doing more than others relative to the level that they can crank up. And I think that that's, that's the question. What is the degree of feasible potential that countries are committing to? And I think that that's a question that is up to each country to think about, but it's also up to each country then to do something about. And so we're, we're in a situation right now where some countries are definitely based on the analysis that uh, we and uh, many other people have done are kind of maximizing or close to maximizing what the possibility is. Other countries aren't. Next slide, please. please. And this is where I think the G20 comes in, right? So the G20, if you actually look at the analysis, the G20, because it's frankly most of the world's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. And so it actually happens to map very well. If we worked on all the G20 and all the G20, we're making really kind of pretty strong commitments under this Paris process and delivering on them. We would actually, and as you can see here, this was a nice study by but the climate action tracker people plus WRI last year. But basically, if all G20 members aligned their NDCs with 1.5, the 2100 warming would be limited to 1.7 Celsius. That means that the G20 countries alone could collectively close three quarters of the temperature gap to get to 1.5. So again, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and even responsibility on the G20 shoulders and that's, again, where I see Indonesia being a really important part of this uh, discussion. Um, next slide, please. OK, so the, the, as we think about this, I, I want to kind of just make a, make a note about, since I work on this topic like and have been, this is my sort of what I do for the US and, and our, in our center. Like, what makes a good target? Why, what, what, why would a tar one target be better than another? Well, there's no universal answer for that, right? <laughs> you just can't, you can't answer that. Uh, it like it has to be X percent below something or other that that doesn't work because every country is different. Every country is in a different stage of even just think of like we do a lot of U.S. China comparative work. Just think of like the difference in age of the coal plants in China versus U.S. Just a very simple difference makes it complicated in terms of what each country should and could do. Right. So there's no one right answer. But I think the guiding questions are, is it ambitious, meaning are countries really trying to crank up? their effort as much as they can within their own development and economic goals, right? So that's that's understood. Is it achievable? Is it something that has actually got a real policy lever or set of levers that could deliver on the target? Because you can't just make up a number, right? You can't just say it's going to be magic and we're going to get to 80% by 2030. A lot of, I remember when the US came out with its target, there was some NGO type groups that were like, well, the US should do 70% by 2030. And there is literally like almost, there's just like no way you could get to 70. So it's like, no, there's no way. So you can't do it in any like reasonable world. You can't actually get to 70 because you just can't shut stuff down that fast. So, so it was just bonkers. It was, there was no policy mechanism to get there. Um, is it 1.5 aligned? In other words, does this help, you know, is this kind of consistent with what the science is telling us needs to happen? Right. And then finally I have like some dots and then because that means like, and other stuff happens. And then ultimately we have to ask, is it then implemented? And I think that's actually a, a fair question that the Chinese would always be asking us in the US. It's great to have a good target, but what are you gonna do it, right? And I feel like today, uh, this year, uh, probably is one of the, I, I've often been up in these in these talks, doing these talks, and the US has always been a little rocky on the implementation side. <laughs> so this year, I feel actually much better. We're actually doing very well, and we've gotten some good things uh, through our Congress in the last year, even in a couple of different uh, uh, actions. So we're on our way, but not, not there. Um, let's go to the next slide. So that's kind of where we are with the global picture, right? So, you know, kind of, we're, we're kind of 1.5s, 
sort of within reach. We know we have to do more. Each country in its own context has to crank up its effort in line with its own development priorities and, and economic realities. Um, but I think there's more room for some countries to move. And I think that's, again, where Indonesia and the G20 come in. Let me speak now specifically about the US, because that was technically the topic of my talk today, which you all came for. So let's go to the US so I can explain a little bit more about that. So the US, we have a 2030 goal. This is just President Biden you know, announcing the target uh, about a year ago. Um, so our goal in the US is by 2030, a 50 to 52% reduction from 2005 levels. Um, and then that's the main part of our commitment, but there's two kind of other goals that are, are out there. One is 2035, 100% clean electricity, and then 2050, net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And um, those are all important parts of the US commitments and that there will have to be then policies that will uh, get us there. Next slide. Um, this is a graphical representation of what those uh, what that trajectory looks like. The solid line that you see there is the historical record of US emissions. And you can see it peaked around 2005 and then kind of has bumpily gone down a bit. It's gone down for a few reasons, some of which are policy related and some of which are market related, but I think uh, I won't go into that right now. But ultimately you can see our, our commitments have us moving toward rapidly, as you can see, rapidly toward that 2050 net zero goal. And 2030, everybody's talking about 2030 because that's the next real like goalpost in this long marathon of getting to global net zero. But we have to always remember that it is the longer marathon. We have to get to 2030 successfully, but once we get to 2030, we can't stop and you know take a rest. We have to keep going and, and get to 2050. But that's where you all are gonna be, I'm sure, helping. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a complicated slide that I guarantee because the screen is small, the people in the back will not be able to see, but I, I can make these slides available for people to, to see afterwards if you want. The point here is that as we think about what our individual countries can do, this is a really important part of, of the process, I think. As we're thinking about what each country can do, obviously it has to be rooted in what is the reality of each country, what are the priorities of each country, what are the kind of development imperatives of each country? Okay, so that's the starting point. It's not the ending point, it's the starting point. What are our priorities and, and, and what do we need to be able to, to do across not just climate goals, but how do we overlay that onto many of these other questions, right? So sometimes you can see clean energy goals really help with, for example, public health goals because the air pollution goes way down if you change over to clean clean energy. So sometimes you can find ways that these, these policies will actually help multiple development priorities at the same time. And so you start with your priorities, right? Then you think about what are our policies, and I'm giving you a, a, an example in the U.S. for, say, electricity, transportation, buildings, industry. What in, in the U.S., there's specific kinds of policies that we can implement because we have specific laws that allow that to happen, right? Each country will be different because each country has different kinds of laws and regulatory regime and this kind of thing, right? So this is not one formula for everybody, but the next step is what are the policy levers or what are the kind of policy mechanisms? And those of you in the policy school would kind of be focusing on those kinds of questions. And then finally, this complicated table at the end is then how do you then translate that? And, and this is where we kind of switch from kind of more of the policy theory stuff to actually doing the analysis part of this, right? Because some, some of you may be doing work that's like quantitative work or modeling work or, or empirical work or something like that that informs the policy community or economics, right? That final piece is actually how you plug the goals in through the policy levers into some kind of analysis. And that's actually a lot of what we do uh, in, our, in our team is kind of looking at how you kind of connect those pieces and then actually project it forward. And so I'm going to now show you a bunch, but I think I might go somewhat rapidly through them. We have a number of different studies that we've done about what the US can do, right? And each of them is a different study and you don't have to kind of worry too much about the change, like slight different differentiations between the studies, but, but basically a lot of them show similar pathways. So let's go to the next step, which is based on that kind of work. Oh, first of all, a little bit on our methodology for those of you who are interested in the research component of this. So some of you might be more interested in policy. Some of you might be more interested in research. For the researchers in the audience, this is more about our methodological approach for this kind of work. We use a large, um, what's called an integrated assessment model, which in incorporates 
a number of different systems in the global economy. So all the sectors, but also linked to land sector, linked to water systems, linked to the climate. And then we're able to adjust different kinds of elements of the economic system to kind of respond to that 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 table of policies. Like we can sort of use the policies to kind of push down or say like, we're gonna deploy more electric vehicles, right? In this way. And then it'll like, and then it will project forward what that will look like in terms of total vehicles and emissions that result from it. So that's a very simple version of, of the story, but that's basically what we do. Um, and, and I think we don't need to go through all the detail here. If people are interested, I could talk afterward or we can talk in Q and A. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is this is basically saying um, for the U.S. again. So this is still kind of a U.S. case study that I'm presenting to you all. For the U.S., what we found is that, and this is something we communicated to the to the Biden administration before they uh, communicated our national target, um, that there are multiple pathways to getting to a slightly more than 50 percent. And I think that this is an important part of what we do, and I think as a policy community, like it's important to reassure our policymakers that there is some robustness in the system, right? So it, what we want to do is kind of find a balance between what is, you know, we, we cannot have a policy that requires every possible out, every possible thing to go right, because we know how the real world works. Not everything goes right all the time. So what we want to do is find a way that even if a few things maybe don't go exactly right, we can still get to our goal, but it's still ambitious enough to be challenging, right? To kind of get us to the to the right level. So it's a it, it's just an it's just a judgment call. But basically, what we found was that there were multiple pathways we could use to get to over fifty percent. We did one study that was focusing on just what the federal government could do, like you know, just sort of with extreme regulation and congressional action at the national level. And then we also did another study, which was what if we kind of combined the federal with some state and local actions of different kinds, and what would that allow us to get to? And we found in both of those studies that you could get to over 50%. And that's the kind of work that I know Indonesia has been working on is it's working on its NDC uh, enhancement. And it's also the kind of work that every other country has to do. The analytical teams in each country have to better understand, the economists have to better understand what the costs are going to look like. The policy people have to understand what the policy mechanisms are. People who work on energy systems have to understand what the energy security and tra energy transition dimensions look like, and then communicate that to our policymakers to give them confidence that if they take a high ambition target, they'll be able to deliver it and still make sure that all of the other national priorities are still intact, right? That health, economic growth, jobs, all those other things, right? Next slide, please. Okay, and I think this is where we start getting it. Next slide, we'll just skip over that because we've already seen that. So this is where, again, it's small text and I know you probably can't see. So you're gonna see a number of these types of slides now, which just essentially show trajectories to getting to 2030. I will make the slides available. So if you wanna see them in more detail, you can just look at them carefully. And I think today for the talk, I'll just go through them quickly. But the different colors, I just wanna explain the different colors on those slides are representing different sectors. Right. So different sectors of the economy. And then if you, you know, if you're getting really into it and you want to kind of figure out, you can actually look at how much we're getting from transportation, how much we're getting from energy, industry, that kind of thing. But for now, I think just the main picture is just to say, okay, we show through the policies, specific policy drivers, we can get to this 50% number. And that's again a US number. It won't be the same for every country. Next slide, please. Um, so this is basically showing us a federal pathway, and I'll, I think I'll, I'll, I'll highlight three different ones. There's electricity, transportation, and buildings. So let's move to the next slide, which will be electricity. Great. Um, so with um, with electricity sector, what we see here, and you can see these, um, I'll, I'll take a step over just to show you. Um, again, you, you won't be able to see the fine detail here, but basically what you can see is this is like the solar and wind, right? Like you can see a really rapid, this is only till 2030. And this is 2020, 2025, and 2030. And so you can see a very rapid expansion of solar and wind over the, over the course of that period. That's something we will see consistently across countries as we all try to get to, to, um, a, to kind of a net zero trajectory. Of course, the specifics of each country will vary, but the general trend, of course, more solar, more wind, 
in Indonesia, more geothermal uh, will likely be part of that uh, part of that story. Okay, next slide or uh, yeah, next next slide. This is about buildings, and this is showing you um, the final energy consumption in buildings. So the total energy that's used in buildings because of new efficiency measures that we can take in buildings. So changing thermostats and you know building additional efficiency uh, insulation and that kind of thing and you can see the energy is going down over time and there's this other these other colors are dividing it out by how much is from electricity versus uh for example gas which we use a lot of to heat our buildings in the u.s so uh a lot of the northern buildings need heating in the winter so you can see that that story there and the next slide and then this is just transportation, which I will actually talk about more in a few minutes. So we'll actually skip to the next slide. So one thing that I wanted to talk about is actually, I think even in the title of my talk is, is this idea that it's, you know, as I told you, there was like, I, we did sort of a few different tests and one was just the national government, right? What can just the national government do? Okay, there were some state policies included, but not focusing on that. The next question though is like, sometimes the national government can't do everything. Right, we all know that. Like national governments have limitations in certain ways, and if we're thinking about how do we get on the most ambitious possible trajectory for climate change, let's just think about this. Like understanding the national governments, they all have their specific constraints, and they're all going to, you know, hopefully try to do as much as they can. But there's often in every country there's different kinds of subnational opportunities. Right? Sometimes those opportunities are at like in our U.S. and the state levels. It turns out in the US, states have a lot of control over the electricity sector. So they can make laws that say, oh, we need to push much more renewables in. And that just, because of our system, the states are allowed to do that. In some countries, that's not possible at all. It's all national, right? Like, so some countries are different. In, in the US, the states can do a lot on electricity policy. There's lots of other examples like that in the United States. We have a federal system, so there's national level authorities. There's state level policy authorities. There's even cities, counties, tribal groups, indigenous groups, right? Have different sort of policy authorities. And so each of those levels of government can do different kinds of things. And they, they don't all have equal power, right? But they often have some power. So for example, I mentioned the states and electricity. Cities also have a lot of control over um, local transportation. I, we were noticing driving over here how many electric buses we see in Jakarta, which is many more than I see in Washington, D.C., by the way. So, um, you know, al already there's some, you know, differences in the U.S. St cities can do more on, say, electric buses. And so what we have to think about is what the combination of policies might be if the national government can't do everything. What can the other parts of society do? Right, other levels of government, and I know in Indonesia there's some, you know, there's a lot of different differentiation by geographical region. There's obviously each province has a governor, and there's like a, you know ability to kind of do things that way. So there's some dimension of subnational action, I think, here in Indonesia that you guys know better than I do for sure. But that that's kind of another question: what can be done at the subnational level, and even sometimes civil society in certain countries, you know, each organization, whether it's religious communities or universities sometimes have control over their their buildings right things like that so they can do things too and so when we talk about an all of society approach it's really kind of the question of hey let's let's pressure our governments to do as much as they can but let's also look to these other levels of society and think about what we can do in each of those contexts because it's actually helping the national government the more that these subnational actors work the more the national government can do because they don't have to like lift the whole the whole country uh, from just the national policy right and that's definitely the case in the us we've done a lot of work on this the more that we see happening at the state and local level the more it's possible for the federal government to to do more and and i think that that's an interesting way to think about the problem um so i have a few things here it builds support for higher national level ambition it builds stronger and more robust long-term politics. If you have the subnational conversations, like imagine if the you know, many governors of Indonesia, like they're working with their areas, their provinces, thinking through what can be done in those locations. Think of the indigenous communities doing sort of linking in and thinking what they they might be interested in doing or able to do. 
And those kind of help the national government do more, right? Um, it creates learning across the areas more quickly because again, it doesn't all have to flow from the top down. And then it provides some flexibility for how to achieve these ambitious goals. So again, it, getting getting the national government confidence that they can do more because they see that it's they're not alone in some ways in trying to deliver on these uh, on these ambitious goals. Next slide. Okay, so this is a second uh, example, which essentially tells you the same story using this all of society pathway. And what we did find is that that actually does show even greater opportunity for reductions because you have this kind of extra capacity and capability by leveraging the all of society approach. Okay, next slide. Okay, I think I'm actually going to skip through this because it's just going to be too small and hard to see. But this is just in the slides, what you can see, and if you want to read this report, we have detail that's sort of broken out of in the US context again, but there might be some parallel to Indonesia here. What our assumptions are for the federal government, like what can happen at the national level, and then what can happen at the subnational level. And the specifics of what can be done in Indonesia at the subnational level will be very different because it just depends on the country's political organization. But the idea that each level can do something is something that is definitely, I think, uh, portable over all countries in a way. Um, next slide, please. That's just more on the policy platform. So next slide. Okay, so here's just an example of comparing the two approaches, the kind of just more federal only and the kind of all in. And you see they're, you know, it's really hard to see from where you guys are sitting, but they're basically the same. But there you can see there's a little more enhanced like kind of expansion of say renewable energies when you can use the states to kind of help press a little bit more on on this system. Okay, so next slide. Um, okay, so so basically, um, I think that's that's too small. So I'm just going to give you the main theme of this slide, which is again that the strategy that I think we're we have been trying to use, and and one of the things I should I should just I actually take a pause here and say, let me address something that I think all of you are aware of, but let me say it very explicitly. So I worked for President Obama a long time ago in the White House. And that was uh, 20, you know, up to 2016. And then we had President Trump from 2016 to 2020. I'm guessing you heard of him. <laughs> and then we had President Biden come in again. And I think it's really important in the US context to note, you know, so I worked with the two more climate friendly administrations, and President Trump was very vocally anti-climate, right? Like he was very uh, aggressive about it. And um, I think it's important to note that that was not a good time for the US climate policy, uh, for sure. I wanna acknowledge that and sort of recognize that. Um, it was not a good time for US international leadership on climate change, because I think a lot of countries were like, you just told us you were gonna do all this stuff and now you're not doing all this. But one thing I will note is that I think that one thing we learned from that time and I and even some of my team here was very involved in both in all of the stages of that process, though, you know, kind of up, down, up, down. But the thing that I think it's important to note, it was it's not like we went back to zero under Trump. I think it's very easy in the international scene. The president of the United States speaks for the country. And so it's easy to sort of think about that president being the only thing that's happening in the US. But it's important to note during that period of time a lot happened at that subnational level. And there was a lot of political mobilizing in the US system at that subnational level that started building more strong politics for climate. And we were involved in some of that work on the analysis side to understand better this subnational component. And so what I would say is even though it sort of seems like maybe it's like this and then Trump and then we're kind of back, it's actually a little more like this, like kind of goes a little like, or maybe like a little down and then hopefully better, right? Like, so I, I think that, you know, we, we wanna think of it, as, I think it's correct to think about it as climate action didn't stop in the United States during those four years. It was a very difficult time, by the way, but like it didn't stop. And I think there was a lot happening at this, which might not have been visible or, or, or visible in the international media, but there was a lot of action happening. Like California was like the second state to announce a net zero goal in like 2017, right? During the Trump administration, like coal phase out happened more rapidly during Trump than it did during Obama because of largely a lot of state policies and some previous federal policies that were starting to bite. And so there's, there were things that were still happening. I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to say it was, everything was fine. <laughs> 
I'm not trying to say that. But what I am trying to say is that what we learned is that it actually is important to build this in the US political context, building the subnational dimension of it, I believe enabled the President Biden administration to then do something much more ambitious than what they would have otherwise been able to do. Just to note, when I when I when we first started having these conversations with the Biden team, they were looking at sort of the 40% range of where they were going to set their, their targets, right? They were thinking that would be the only possible target. But I think that because of all the subnational action, they actually realized more could be done. And so that's kind of, a, I think, a, a, an important lesson. Happy to talk more about U.S. politics later if you want. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to skip this one. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so then there are two other specific studies that I want to call to your attention. Again, if you're interested in this topic, uh, we have actual longer reports on each of these things that are sort of taking the previous slides that I've shown you, both for the global and for the U.S., were like all of economy. So electricity sector, industry, transportation, et cetera, right? It's also important as you all are thinking about economics and policy and maybe even technologies, a lot of the action will happen at sector level. Like it's most policies are not all of economy. The only real all of economy policy is like a carbon price. Most of the other policies are just specific. So in the US, for example, we have policies on electricity sector to support renewable energy deployment, right? But that's a specific sectoral policy. You can think of another sectoral policy in transportation systems, right? So subsidies for electric vehicles, that only is relevant to transportation, right? It doesn't really count anything for land use, doesn't, doesn't affect it. But basically, sectors are where a lot of the action happens. And so we've done some of the same work looking at sectors. And so I have a few slides here. This is one that shows just work that can be done on transportation. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and basically saying that I think that on transportation, I've, I've sort of bucketed things in three areas. So we have recent congressional actions, which I think many of you may have heard. If you follow climate change, you might have heard this. If you don't, you might not. But this year, this summer, we had a big new piece of legislation passed in the United States that has a lot of climate provisions. It's actually quite good news. I was, I and my entire community in the US were very, very happy and relieved that this finally got through because they've been working on it for a year. But Congress passed this new law that includes a lot of very good provisions like the kinds we've been modeling to support rapid energy transition in our country. And so it's not enough. It's not the only thing we have to keep doing more, just like the usual story but it's significantly helpful. And so one of the things that was in there is an EV tax credit, an electric vehicle tax credit. And, and again, different countries will do this differently, but the big question that each country is facing is how do we encourage faster EV electric vehicle deployment, right? Um, how do we get people to adopt electric vehicles? Because that is pretty much the way of the future. I see you know, already happening here in Indonesia. Um, you know, with electric vehicle, electric buses, right? So, but maybe in Indonesia, the focus should be maybe more on charging stations in between cities, right? Instead of just in Jakarta, right? So maybe that's one of the things that is a policy focus for Indonesia. That's actually also a focus in the US, by the way, but but one of the things that was in this congressional law is how to support individual families or people to buy new electric vehicles. And so we did it through a tax credit. That's essentially just a for all practical purposes, it's like a cash payment, like you just offset the cost of the EV, right? Um, and so that's an important part. But there's also other things. There's non-federal actions that can be done. So these states and local communities can do charging infrastructure. That's something that I think can, can helpfully happen there. And then there's other kinds of federal regulations that can improve the efficiency of the, of the current fleet. Next slide, please. And this is an interesting uh, one, I think, to me. Uh, you can't see probably the details, but the upshot of this slide is saying that in order to hit our goals, uh, we, and in fact, with these policies, we expect that by 2030, about half of all new vehicles sold in the United States will be electric vehicles. That's eight years from now, right? And by the way, when we first started looking at this number, maybe two or three years ago, it was more shocking than it is today. What, I, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the, the, the rate of improvement of electric vehicles has been surprisingly good, right? So more people are adopting, more people want electric vehicles, the costs are going down. So I think that this goal is attainable and I think that it's gonna be realistic for us to hit 50%. It's still hard, 
but hopefully we can get to 50% sales by 2030. Now that does not mean 50% on the road because there's turnover time. You guys know that, right? So it takes a cars, people keep them for what, 10, you know, 10, 15, whatever years, right? So it'll take a while for the, the EVs to kind of replace all of the old cars, but still will be an important step. The one on the right shows freight vehicles showing about 25% of heavy vehicles like trucks will be electric by uh, 2030 in the US. Next slide, please. Okay. A second sector that I want to take a, a deep dive into is methane. Now, you, you heard me mention methane a few minutes ago when I was talking about the outcomes from the Glasgow Climate Conference. And I was involved in that on the Biden team because that was actually a really big push that we and other countries were making to try to raise the profile of reducing methane emissions. Methane is not normal, you know, it's not part of... Um, for example, a, a number of countries just have a, a CO2 target, right? So, for example, China still has most just a CO2 target, right? A carbon carbon target has not included non-CO2 gases, but methane is a really potent greenhouse gas and is uh, a really significant um, uh, opportunity because a lot of methane reduction can be very low cost, and in some sectors such as energy sector, oil and gas. Uh, sometimes you can even make money by reducing methane leaking, right? Because it's a it's an asset, it's a commodity that has value. That's not the case for everything. And so, for example, in agriculture, it's harder to control methane. For think of rice fields, right? It's hard to control methane from rice fields. There's some ways you can do it, but it's 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 harder than in oil and gas. But in waste sector, there's some opportunities there as well. So everything's going to be again uniquely tailored to each country. What are the opportunities? What are the costs? We did sort of a deep dive study on U.S. on methane and showed for the first time that U.S. can get to 30% reduction in methane by 2030, which is actually quite significant. It's quite a large amount of methane reduction. And there's some nice elements of, of that methane reduction for the global climate as well, because methane is a very, very potent near-term uh, climate warmer. Next slide, please. Okay, and then a final piece that we that we've been doing in our uh, in our team on understanding U.S. opportunities is thinking about how to structure a coal phase out, and all of our work has been uh, sort of pointing to a, the same message, which is that almost completely coal has to be phased out by 2030 in the U.S. for us to get onto our onto our goals. Gas will come shortly after that, so coal first, then gas. But we're on a trajectory to try to get um, nearly 100% clean energy by 2035. And a really important part of that is getting rid of coal soon. Every country will be different. So China, Indonesia will be a different trajectory. But I think it's important to note that both China and Indonesia are currently thinking very hard about how to accelerate that coal transition. Um, and I think I understand, you know, we've actually done some collaborative work on Indonesia as well. And there's really some genuine opportunities in Indonesia for more rapid coal phase out here. And I know that the international community has been interested in that. There's a lot of health benefits that come from phasing out coal because it's very dirty fuel, right? Like it creates a lot of air pollution. So to the extent that that's something that that fits in well with Indonesia's uh, development goals, I think that will be a, a very exciting area to be watching in the next couple of years. Um, next slide. Okay, and then my final piece on the US is about the 2050 net zero. And as you heard, I, I did lead the writing for this report under with, with the Biden team, um, but it was a report that was done across the whole US government. Some of the people that uh, are on our team at Maryland uh, did the analysis for it, but there's also working with EPA and a number of other agencies. So our net zero goal is just, we're gonna get to net zero emissions by 2050, that's the goal. And that includes all greenhouse gases, including methane, nitrous oxide, uh, you know, HFCs, but also, of course, includes CO2. Next slide, please. Okay, this is super small, so I'm not going to uh, go through all of it. But so this is the report. You can download it if you so choose. Um, but basically, um, one thing that just to note here that I wanted to flag that, you know, under the Paris Agreement, all countries are supposed to report on their long-term strategies, or sometimes they're called long-term low carbon development strategies, or there's lots of different names for them, but they're required under Paris to communicate to the international community, how does each country anticipate mid-century strategy for their, their own context? And so this was our contribution, the US's contribution to that conversation. Paris Agreement invites countries to be transparent 
about what they want, what they intend to do. One thing that's interesting, though, is that a lot of the patterns you see in these long-term strategies are quite similar across countries. It's the details that are different, right? But one thing is that you decarbonize electricity. So that's something that will happen in the U.S., in Indonesia, and everywhere else, right? We have to go from a heavy carbon-sourced electricity system, meaning a lot of coal, to one that is very little coal, not so much gas, and is mostly renewable, that's kind of all countries kind of need to work on that strategy. Timing is different, specifics are different, but decarbonize electricity, that's a main component. Second, you electrify as many things as you can to use that clean electricity, right? So think about electric vehicles. It's exactly the same thing. You're electrifying your vehicles, you use clean electricity, and now you can get around from, from you know, you can drive around with no climate impact. And some people even like electric vehicles even better than regular cars. So we'll, we'll see if that continues, but that's how it is. You reduce the uh, waste of energy, you know, just more efficiency. Um, you reduce methane and other non-CO2s. And then you scale up something called CO2 removal, which can be done either through forests, planting trees, expanding forests, expanding mangroves, blue carbon, lots of things like this or you can do it technologically. So sometimes people are now even working on specific types of technology that will actually draw CO2 out of the air, you know, technologically and put it underground. Next slide. So those are patterns that are similar across all countries. You're gonna see those same themes come up in Indonesia's context. It's just that the, the, the timing and the details might be different, right? Um, this is the ultimate, you know, kind of result of our long-term strategy assessment for the US, which you can see it's a similar, type of figure to what we've done for the 2030s, um, just showing the differences by different sectors. So this is um, what we get from energy efficiency in, in the US. This is what we get from decarbonizing electricity. This is what we get from um, switching to different types of fuels. So for example, one of the things that's quite difficult is how do you get industry to reduce its energy? Because sometimes industry needs heat. It doesn't need like electricity only, it needs heat, like think of steel right? It needs heat. And so how do you get the heat is, is a question for industry. And so process heating, for example, maybe you can do it through hydrogen, right? That you make in a clean way um, and, and that kind of thing. Maybe in, And maybe in some specific applications, another thing that's hard is um, aviation. Like where you, it's hard to have battery jets. Like there's no such thing as far as I know. So you have to have some kind of fuel, but maybe use biofuel, right? To, to, for the jets for the airplanes. Um, so you have to think about those difficult to decarbonize areas. There might be some niche applications there. So that's this energy transitions, non-CO2 reductions, uh, enhanced land sinks. So this is like expanding forests in the US. And then finally, technological removal, uh, like I mentioned before. So that's the US case. That's the US case. And there, there will, like I said, that this figure would look probably quite different for Indonesia, right? This is, you know, you'd get the, the same themes, but different level, different like heights of the blocks and, 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 and that kind of thing, right? So that's the kind of work that I think needs to be done that's helpful for our governments to know. And then that helps them sort of roadmap out what they need to do to get there. Um, what you see on this side is, is, is just our, this is a number of different sort of slight variations and scenarios where we made different assumptions about different sort of strategies, right? And what that allowed us to do is to kind of see how much variation there might be if certain kinds of technologies did not evolve quickly enough or, or whatever. Uh, just a little bit of a robustness check on, in some ways on our, on our work. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is just showing one example in electricity, and um, I think this is really just there to show how difficult it is for all of us, including in the U.S., to do these kinds of long-term transitions. Um, this is just showing you, this is again from our long-term strategy report. Um, I think you can even see this from the floor um, here. This is electricity capacity additions, so how many new megawatts of electricity capacity do we need to add every year to make our goal, right? Because basically remember the goal here is we're shutting down some coal essentially, shutting down some natural gas and adding a lot of solar and wind. And there's some other detail, but that's basically it, right? And so this is what it looked like historically. This is like fossil fuel here, this gray area. And these blue and, ye these blue and yellow are renewables like solar and wind, right? And that's what's happened historically. 
in terms of our total capacity additions. These three bars show you what the average annual amount will be of additions in the decade of the 2020s, the decade of the 2030s, and the decade of the 2040s in the United States. So you can see our historical best ever was that amount. And every year this decade, we have to do much better than that. And every year next decade, we have to do better than that. And every year the next decade, we have to do better than that. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible because things can happen rapidly. Um, and I, I think we shouldn't get too hung up on that. But like, you know, think of all of us have our smartphones, like, you know, that happened somewhat rapidly, right? Where we can, you know, that, that technological diffusion and deployment went quickly once it started. But so that's not impossible, but it's just showing like the level of difficulty of maybe getting there. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is, I think, um, worth worth just a moment. Um, this is, we were also involved in doing the the, the 2016 U.S. long term strategy in our in our group. And one of the criticisms we got from that one, which was fair, was that there wasn't really much strategy in it. Like it was more like here is the pathway, right? But the strategy, meaning like what's the thoughtful thing that we're trying to do? What's the policy? mechanism like how do we approach this problem so we tried to put i tried to put in a little bit more on the strategy part this time so we divided it out into four areas and again this may or may not be directly portable over to indonesia context i'm not saying it is but this is like how we were thinking about it so one was just federal leadership so making sure that we're doing the right things as the federal government and that is going to be unique to each country but but that's one thing innovation of course one thing that we all know and i think and agree the better the and cheaper the technology the more our governments can do because it's inexpensive right again think of today versus 10 years ago uh, led lighting is only 10 percent or less of what it cost 10 years ago same with solar power wind energy has dropped probably 60 or 70 percent in cost so the the change in cost just from a decade makes it tremendously easier for our private sector and our governments to do more stuff now than it was previously. So innovation remains important. Non-federal leadership is this kind of um, thinking about what are the other, like what are the governors, what can they do? What can the cities do? That kind of question. And then finally, the all of society action. So again, thinking about our organizations, you know, whether it's um, universities, communities of faith, other kinds of educational organizations or whatever, they can also do their part. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so this is something that as we're at the University of Indonesia, I, I you know, we're, we're all here as scholars, right? We're all here to kind of think about what we can do uh, to, you know, obviously, we are all here in this room, because we're interested in policy, we're interested in climate. But we're also here because we're scholars, and we're thinking about what can we do as scholars to help with this discussion, right? And one thing that I think is important for us all to be sharing, and this is why I'm, I'm excited to be here with you, um, is, is how can we better understand and then communicate to our governments the benefits of decarbonization, of just transition, of green economy? How do we be, cl be clearer about what those benefits are? Because it's one thing to say, Trust us, there will be a lot of jobs compared to doing an analysis that really kind of looks at empirical, the, you know, what we've learned in the past, thinks about how quickly we're going to be deploying new technologies, and then comes up with a defensible result on like what we really believe could be the job benefits of a clean and green or a green and just transition, right? There's a big difference between one which is very vague and one which might be rooted in analysis and empirical work that is trusted by not only our research community, but also by our governments, right? And so it's, I think, quite important and exciting for us to be thinking about this as a global community of researchers, a global community of scholars. How do we understand those questions? And, you know, I think right now is a really important moment for all of us, for you all who are you know, early career and working on these questions to think about these. So public health, how do we do better about capturing those benefits and communicating them? Quality of life and justice, a very hard one to kind of really wrap our heads around, but like thinking about equity between different groups. I know, you know, in the U.S. we have uh, a different sort of racial groups and different uh, uh, tribal and indigenous groups that we have that that are very important to make sure that the policies aren't impacting those groups in a really 
un, unequal way, an, an inequitable way, right? So thinking about how we how we understand those principles, that even ties into things like ethics and and philosophy. You know, even as public policy people, it's you know that kind of touches on those. So there's some real questions there that I think need to be thought through. Uh, economic growth, which again we're in the faculty of business and economics here. So that'll be one that's sort of in, in line with what people are thinking about now, but we can definitely do better on how do we understand the GDP impacts? How do we understand, again, the kind of broader questions about um, the quality of jobs that happen uh, under, under a transition? Like, you know, some jobs are probably better than others, right? In terms of the quality of life for that worker. And so how do we kind of capture that because that might be part of a, a clean transition. The job quality might be better than being uh, needing to work in a coal mine or something like that. So th how do we kind of say that in a way that's sensitive and respects the work that people are doing, but also says like, but there might be some other ways we could do this. And then finally thinking about conflict, right? Like how does this maybe reduce conflict globally? I think there are some real questions there that are probably have good answers as we kind of get less resource de dependent um, uh, nation states, um, but how do we actually do that in a way that our governments believe? Okay, next slide. Okay, I think this might be my last slide, so you've made it. Um, back to the Indonesia question. So this is really where, again, so this whole, you know, I wanted to use the U.S. as sort of a case study because I'm, you, you all know better what works best for Indonesia than I do, but when I think about the U.S., that's what the kind of a, the kind of work that we've been doing in our group and that we you know want the US to be in the role we want the US to be playing in the world which is a constructive engaged role in the world for Indonesia I I I feel great excitement about this G20 opportunity I know that the G20 is coming up very soon so there's not lots of time to work on it but I think it's a really important moment for Indonesia to have that voice. And so I'm excited. I've, you know, certainly saw some of that at the T20, which I was just at the Think20, which your faculty, your department's been involved in uh, hosting um, in Bali. Uh, but, but basically the, the, the Indonesian voice, I think is, is, is a potentially very critical one in the G20, because the, as I mentioned before, G20 is um, that if we kind of, Think if we figure out the G20, we kind of help most of the climate problem in terms of the emissions side, right? And so Indonesia's leadership, Indonesia's thinking right now about its own emissions commitments. And so how Indonesia kind of thinks through that, I think is really important, but also I think how Indonesia presents that to the rest of the G20 will also be really welcome. And I think that that's something that I'm um, really excited to, to look at. Um, we're also, you know, certainly watching and interested in thinking about questions like rapid coal phase down in Indonesia. How do you do the financing right to help with the with this with that structured phase out that I think we all know needs to happen? Um, how do we deploy renewable energy? How do we integrate peatland and forest strategies in the right way? Uh, how do we understand how to finance the overall transition with ideally a, a good amount of international help? Um, and like I said here, I think there's uh, the theme of this year's G20 is recover together, recover stronger. And I think that there's lots of good opportunities together to do that together as we're uh, moving forward in this uh, agenda. So I think with that next slide, I think that might be it. Okay, that's it. So thanks very much. And we can have questions. Okay. Okay, so we allow for uh, questions. Yeah, please. Uh, good afternoon, sir, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and sharing, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, from your presentation, I got an, an insight into how we to be aware more about the climate change action in the all-in strategy. Mm. All your data shows that we should still optimistic and don't give up to a target and achieving ambitious uh, national climate goals. In the reality, especially in Indonesia, there is a phenomenon that I worry about the increasing population. Mm -hmm. In Indonesia, it's predicted will have a democratic bonus in 2030. In one hand, it's like an economic opportunity, but uh, with the climate change, I worry that it's really hard to control uh, the climate policy enhancement in society. Uh, since demographic bonus, which means more production, uh, more energy resources, and more coal, more emission, 
I think uh, the global population is also increasing for the next decades. So I'm curious, how do you see this situation, Mr. Holtman? Uh, I also questioning myself, uh, is it uh, realistic to limit uh, warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius? But if we don't do something, our earth will be gone as soon as possible, right? Uh, thank you. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, there's kind of two dimensions of it. I think I'll, I'll go in reverse order. Like, you know, why 1.5, I think is one of the questions, you know, is how important is it? Um, I, you know, it's, it's, I think the thing to remember about this is it's, it's, it's not so much, you know, in some ways the science is determining, you know, what the 1.5 is, and then us trying to hit that goal. It's really kind of, uh, you know, it, it's sort of the question of, human well-being right like if the house is on fire uh you really want to put it out and it, and put it out as quick as you can because you want to limit the damage and i think we are in that mode right now where you know increasingly in lots of countries you know you've seen floods in pakistan you know just the last week and i i i'm sure all of you follow this there's you know there are a lot of climate linked natural disasters happening and the the impacts are happening today and they are affecting countries around the world. They will continue to, you know, affect the U.S. for sure, but also Pakistan, Indonesia, India. You know, the whole every country is going to have some kind of impacts. And so, a lot of what we're talking about with 1.5 is we're not that we're we're only at 1.1 right now, and we're already seeing like climate impacts. We expect more to happen, and the more that we go up to 1.5, the worse all that stuff is going to be. So a lot of this is a question about protecting our people, right? It's a question about like the poorest among us, but also everybody uh, being impacted. So I think that that's the question of like, what, how bad is it to go beyond 1.5? I mean, it's bad. And, and I think that, that we just have to recognize that. And so like, if we don't hit the target, we don't hit the target and we have a worse off world. And so, um, that's just to keep in mind. And I know you weren't arguing, by the way, to say that we should not hit 1.5, but the, it's a fair question. What if we don't reach that goal? What if we don't reach the goal? And, and it was just, this was the whole point of that IPCC 1.5 report from 2017, which was to essentially recalibrated where the international community was aiming for. It used to be two. And then after the scientists did their work, they discovered that even the difference between 1.5 and two was quite severe. And so the recalibration happened to try to get to 1.5. So that's kind of just to say, I think we really need to kind of keep trying for the 1.5. Now, the other question was an in Indonesia's case, like, you know, there are a lot of, you again, you all know better than I do, right? So what, what is gonna be possible and what, what is the right approach to take for Indonesia? Um, all I will say is that, you know, first of all, let's remember that the world is changing quickly, right? Compared to even, as I mentioned, five years ago, 10 years ago, our technology costs are much lower for these clean technologies. And so it's important, especially for people who are like, you guys, you're flexible minded. <laughs> you're the young generation. <laughs> you know how things can change quickly, right? We have to be thinking of our, our world as a world that can change quickly, recognizing that in the past, it often doesn't, right? I understand that. But there are ways that sometimes the world can change quickly. And so the real challenge for all of us, not to put it all on you, by the way, for all of us, is to try to look at ways that let's try to forget all the things that we know kind of like a lot of people still think it's really costly to do renewable energy. That's no longer true. That's actually not true at all. It's, it's usually cheaper to do renewables now. <laughs> so like things change quickly. And so let's remember to kind of remind our governments that maybe more is possible than what they think. And I think that's the only thing I can say, like, just to kind of keep that focus on, like, opening the possibilities and then demonstrating it through our research, like showing, showing the path, not to say trust us, but just say show here's how we can do it. Right. So that's where we need to go. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mister, for your nice lecture. Um, I'm interested in uh, the nexus of two index. First is ecological footprint that many stu many studies uh, show that uh, it's 
uh, can explain the more multidimensional in environmental degradation than uh, uh, CO2 emission. And the other index in is, is human, dev uh, human development index that show the human well-being. When I plot them, uh, I can see that, especially in G20 country, that the more higher HDI also have uh, the higher ecological footprint. Uh, it means that more the more higher ed, uh, human development index country has more higher env environmental degradation. How we can explain that? As we know that more human development index shows that, so that more well-being well people, more educated people, uh, uh, that may can reflect more knowledge about the climate action. Uh, but why in G20 countries that uh, more higher uh, development index in uh, the people, but have uh, the more higher and in ecological footprint also? Uh, thank you, Mr. I, I love that question. And thank you for asking a, a thoughtful and provocative question right right it's 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 a good it's a you've identified an interesting phenomenon and, and i think is a correct kind of question for us to be asking in a in a university context right so why is this why is there a conflict seeming between human development index and ecological footprint so i think i have an answer to that but i'm not sure so i'd certainly welcome further conversation on it right so i, I don't i don't think i know all of all of this question um so let's think about what we mean when we say human the footprint and think about what we mean when we say human development index and just very superficially right now the ecological footprint of say my country is rooted in the fact that a lot of our energy is still delivered by fossil fuel intensive industries. So it has a high relatively ecological footprint. So that's one thing people in my country do a lot of flying around like I just came here, right? So, you know, so there's there's things that consumption side and the production side are both heavily fossil fuel driven. And I'm 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 thinking climate now only, but like there you can probably make this extension to other parts of environmental or ecological footprint. So so let me just speak to the climate question, and I think it might be somewhat analogous more broadly. So that's where we are today. Um, human development index is also relatively, I don't think it's probably as high as it should be in my country, but like, you know, human development index also high in my country because we've invested in education, we have infrastructure, by no means is it a perfect country, but like, you know, there's a lot of investment that has happened historically that has brought good health benefits, good health outcomes, you know, relatively good life lifetime um, life expectancies, these kinds of things, right? So that's relatively high. the The footprint is relatively in you know resource intensive because of what we are today. Now, if I'm going to say that's where we are right now, now bear with me for one minute. Let's like hold that in mind, and then like fast forward to like what if we succeed in this long-term strategy that I talked about. What if we succeed? We might not, but what if we do? <laughs> what if we do? What if we succeed? If we succeed in the long-term strategy, our electricity is clean, our health benefits go up even further, and our resource utilization goes down, right? Our, especially our non-sustainable resource utilization goes down. So our ecological footprint makes a dramatic improvement if we hit our long-term strategy goal in 2050. And HDI probably goes up incrementally more from where it is today. The reason I put those two things together is to say, again, just with my country as an example, is that the, the question you ask is about one snapshot in time. And I'm not saying that in some ways other countries shouldn't have space to develop because that's a whole other difficult question, right? But let's talk about my country. Like right now, it's intensive, it's resource intensive. It's less bad than it used to be, but it's still resource intensive. But it will be get again, if we're successful, we'll be getting much better. 
so that the, the ecological footprint will improve, I hope, dramatically. HDI will go up incrementally. So in that case, what I'm all I'm asking for you then is to think about this being uh, something that's evolving over time and not just the snapshot of today. Because I think you're correct today. You know, correct today, like US is a big consumer of fossil energy. It's the world's second largest emitter of, fossil, of, of greenhouse gases, right? Second biggest emitter. If we're successful by 2050, we will not be the second largest emitter. I mean, there will be a lot of very small emitters and I don't know where we'll be, but, you know, but we'll be very low, hopefully net zero, right? And so in that sense, I, you know, what I'm hoping for, what my effort is to try to get us to move on that direction. And if we think about that, what it means is that the ecological footprint is not always, it, it right now might be correlated to HDI, but it's not fundamentally caused in that way, right? It's not causing the HDI to be high because we can get our energy from other clean sources. We can have a cleaner economy. We can move away from this resource intensive type, type of lifestyle. And I think that will make some improvement at least, but I, I don't know, we'll have to run the experiment, right? Okay, uh, more question? Any more question here? professor for the time uh i will ask two questions prof the first one uh from your story i can tell that even in the us uh there is uh, there are peoples in state of doubting or denial of climate change even your president <laughs> from the story uh could you tell could you please tell how uh, the government, even international or the federal one, uh, keeping or making their belief that the climate change is true. Uh, even in Indonesia, I think, uh, there are many people uh, uh, still doesn't believe that it's true. Uh, so your information or your story can we implement in Indonesia. The second one is, uh, Professor, I think uh, one me uh, the measuring from the welfare or prosperity in the world still, still in money or econo economic growth that uh, in traditional way uh, how can we make something indicators or measurement that uh, including the climate change in their measurement that all the country uh, uh, all the country in the world will believe that oh it's not the USA that's the richest one so which in the mean of prosperity or welfare is not measurement in money or uh, P GDP or GDRP. So we include the environment uh, in using of uh, carbon or carbon emission and the other. Thank you, sir. Thank you for thank you for both of those questions. Uh, the first question, I think, if I heard right, is kind of the question of there are a lot of people around the world and everybody in every country. Uh, there are some people who don't think that climate change is either real or important, you know, or some combination, maybe both. <laughs> uh, um, and, and that's certainly true in 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 my country. And I think maybe uh, my country has some specifics about people being very vocal about stuff. And uh, you, I'm sure you heard uh, like our former president is very vocal about this as well. So, um, but I'll speak again to the US case. Uh, I, I think, first of all, I do think that in the US, there have been a, a number of interesting studies, by the way, of people's view of climate change, even cross country. Like, you know, I think I remember seeing a study of 30 countries and doing polling, like asking people, do you think this is real? 
how important is it? Those kinds of questions, right? Uh, I don't remember where Indonesia fell out in the list, by the way. It's just a long time ago that I looked at this. But those kinds of studies are quite interesting and they're illuminating. I think the U.S. tends to be at the top or close to the top of those lists, but it's not the only country where there's like high degrees of skepticism. Um, so, so it's a phenomenon that's very important. That's my first point. It's a phenomenon that does happen. It, it happens a lot in my country. There's a lot of skeptics relative to some other places. Like in Europe, there's fewer people who just doubt climate change is happening. Um, but I know that's, that's something that happens everywhere to some degree. The second thing I would say is that in the US, and I can speak to this more sort of, I, I do follow this a little bit more, that, actually, let me say two things. There will always be some people in my country who never believe it. There's just, I mean, I just have to myself, like at some point you just have to give up. Like there's just going to be 5% or 10% of people who just, there's not even worth talking to because they're just never going to, they're never going to change. <laughs> That's fine. But there's been an increasing number of people in the middle who have, if you look at polling over the last 20 years, um, even over half of Republicans in my country, which are the more conservative party, right? Even over half of Republicans think that climate change is real and we should do something about it. Two things, right? Like that's the polling, like that's Donald Trump's party. <laughs> so 50%, over 50% of his party think that climate change is real and that we should do something about it. Like something more than just sneeze at it, right? Like, like do something regulatory to kind of improve the situation. So. The polling has improved overall. I think that the numbers are something like 70% of US population thinks that climate change is real now. Like it's not a hunt, you know, my opinion, it, we're actually listening to the science. It would be like 99%, right? Like, or hundred percent, but it's 70% that for my country is quite good. So the point is our politics are generally improving on, do people believe that climate change is important? Do people believe it's real? And frankly, over 80% of people, regardless of climate change, think that we should do more clean electricity, renewables, solar. That's way, way more than it was uh, 20 years ago, like 80% plus. And that's the polling is consistent in, our, in my country. That includes both Democrats and Republicans. So it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of support for clean energy because frankly, you don't have to believe in climate change to think that clean energy is actually a good thing because it, you know, we don't have to pollute the air, you know, there's lots of benefits that come from it. So um, that's one thing I would say on that question. And then the other um, uh, the other question you had was about, oh, I, I remember, um, other indicators of human well-being, right? It's, I think that's a really, really good question and one that's fueled many, many dissertations over the years, I think. Um, we even had a, 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 when I first came to the University of Maryland, the the professor next to me was one of the uh, big people in something called ecological economics. His name is Herman Daly, and I recommend his work to you if you're interested in this question, D-A-L-Y. Uh, wrote a lot of important papers on understanding human well-being as more than just GDP, <laughs> and that GDP is too narrowly, cons too narrowly defined, and policymakers think of it as being a kind of integrated metric, where it is really just a narrow metric of human well-being. And um, I honestly, that's a little bit beyond my my skill of explaining well, uh, like how, how we should be thinking about it. But I just want us to echo and say there are very good thinkers out there who have looked at this. And we definitely should be, to the extent we can, and, you know, working with our policymakers as they're thinking about economic benefits. That's a little bit part of what I was saying in that slide about understanding the economic benefits. I think I will welcome your comment as an improvement on my slide, which is to say not just the benefits in the conventional sense, but making sure we're communicating that well-being is more broadly construed than what GDP actually tells us. So I, I, I think that was a great uh, addition. Thank you. Any more question? Attention. Um, thank you for the, uh, uh, I want to ask, uh, as we know that uh, today coal price is very sexy, uh, does any of the state's government have any incentives to call industries in America to change their business to renew renewable energy? Uh, I repeat, sorry, does United States government have any incentives to call industries 
to change their business to renewable energy. So let me let me just make sure I heard the question. But was the question: Does the U.S. federal government have any incentives to the coal industry to change to renewables? Right. Um, so the way our policy system has evolved, I think that the answer is no to the question of: Are there any direct benefits from the federal government to coal companies to switch to renewables? But what I what I what we have done is sort of a combination of policies that seeks to do something similar, right? Like, so it's not one specific policy because the way, the, just the way our system is, there's, uh, you know, often privately held utilities or investor owned utilities and privately held coal companies and this kind of thing. So it's a little different. What well, you might know this already, but like, you know, here in Indonesia, you've got a more sort of state involvement, I think, in, in, the, in, in the electricity sector. But for us, it works a little bit differently and the policies are a little different. So the policies are more about retraining the workforce. So it's, it's almost like thinking about, think about the workers, like what do we need to do to make sure the workers are okay in the fossil industry, the coal industry. And so there's a lot of programs that are there for people who are either mining the coal, those people can get some kind of job retraining so that they have a useful skill now to do something else. Similarly, for people who are running coal-fired power plants, some of them can get transition and work in other kinds of energy sector companies, um, not necessarily renewables, but maybe even gas in the short term. Um, the other thing, though, is that there are also um, um, uh, supports for um, coal communities, like there's sort of more what they call block grants. So there's basically funding to go to um, communities that are affected by the energy transition. Let's put it that way. It, and, and those communities that are affected by the energy transition could include, for example, like, I don't know how much you followed the US um, policy over the last year, but there was one Senator who's from a coal state, a coal mining state. His name is Joe Manchin. Did you hear this guy ever? I don't know. Anyway, so this one Senator like was holding up the entire, like President Biden's law like for a, like a year and, and so and also he owns a coal company like of all things so he was like holding it up this one guy because we have a very it's like 50 50 50 senate right so it's right on the edge so we needed this one guy to sort of agree to everything and in part because of that one guy there's all this work there's all this stuff in there to help coal mining communities and they, the way we do it is, is not the companies, but is more the community to make sure the community is okay. And then the way that it works in the US is that the companies, honestly, they're not taken care of. They'll have to just go out of business if they do, yeah. Any more question? It could be very different for Indonesia, by the way. There might, there might be a different structure that is used to make sure that like PLN can sort of transition out from coal as rapidly as possible, maybe with even some international finance that would allow that to happen. But that's a, just a different situation. Yeah. Maybe because uh, before we go to the uh, question, I have a question mm -hmm. too. Uh, yeah, I had a research uh, uh, published and it was about uh, trying to compare between states that did the market restructuring and deregulation. And then, uh, yeah, one of the results is to show that those um, states that really encourage for market restructuring for electricity sector, uh, trying to ask the investor owned utility to really uh, sell their, their uh, generators and then try to buy from the market. Uh, also, those states are usually are the one who are very progressive in uh, uh, promoting the renewable energy. But uh, besides the results, I just like uh, data shows that those states are having a very higher electricity rate compared to those uh, conservative states. And also, uh, my my research showed that those utilities that are imposed to do market restructuring and then you know using all the the market power uh, uh, power uh, power market by by energy from power market are less efficient so uh, what what is the the policy 
try to to balance because uh, on in uh, in one hand that you want to really push the renewable energy and then clean energy, but at the end, at uh, it's also more costly and more pricey uh, compared to coal. And then uh, it goes to the consumer because they have to pay electricity rate uh, is higher. So besides besides maybe other policy that try to uh, give incentives to, to the utility, um, how do you think that, maybe it's your opinion, how do you think um, uh, kind of policy that also give incentive to to what is lost in the consumer part. Yeah, yeah those are those are really good questions, and um, it was great. Professor Johanna and I discovered we both took a course by the same professor in energy and electricity economics at Berkeley. So share that uh, connection. And um, um, so there's sort of two parts, I think, to your question, and I, you know, I don't know the full answer. So let me just say that. Um, but but one thing I would say is that if you're looking at electricity rates in the U.S., you probably remember this from your studies there. The U.S. Um, electricity system and even energy system. I, I teach a course in in energy policy and I start my lecture, I start my course by saying, um, um, that the energy market is incredibly, uh, messed up. There's, there's lots of, it's, it's, it, there's lots of, um, policies and, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, regulatory, elements on our electricity rates that, you know, it's very, very messed up system. Like it's not really a, re it's not a real market for energy, right? It's, it's just a kind of concocted market. And so that means that the electricity price is integrating all of these things. It's right. Like how much is the generation, but there's also like, how do we, you know, what's the kind of like, you know, regulatory regime of like how the, how are, how are the companies getting paid back for their capital and, you know, then there's the question of, you know, uh, the, all, all the things that you know better than I do, but like, you know, how, how are the, how are the rates set by the public utilities commissions and all these other kinds of things that end up like kind of all like, it's not all, it's not bad. They're all there for sort of specific reasons, but they end up kind of messing up the pricing. So it's not like really a great metric of like what the costs are necessarily. So that's one observation. It's not to say you're not correct, but just an observation. So the 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 the, the thing about the, the renewables cost though, is that a lot of what we're seeing is the question of what, again, the question of what's the legacy cost of something and where would we be today if we were buying new? And so for new capacity that's going in, renewables are often a lot cheaper um, than they used to be, is all I was saying. And so they're a lot cheaper than what they used to be, and in many cases are competitive with coal for new generation. For old generation, the question is, is it paid off? What's the kind of, you know, what's the kind of regulatory structure for that, uh, for that system? So I think that the prices are, are only an imperfect indicator of the overall cost for like looking ahead into the future. So if we're doing more work like that, as we're sort of transitioning, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily I, like I myself am not that concerned that historically the renewables have been more expensive because I think that right now we're in a better we're in a better regime. This doesn't mean it's not worth looking at and worth worrying about, but that's kind of how I look at it. And then the other question is really, in some ways, the the flip side of your question is, could we expect that the regulatory regimes would improve in the future so that the rates would go down? And I th I do think there, by the way, even in this recent legislation that passed, there is a lot of incentive for like purchasing the clean energy at a lower rate. So there's production tax credit, investment tax credit, and even some, um, again, some support for low income to make sure that the prices aren't too high. So I think you can sort of address it by the kind of regulatory regime question, the fact that it's the actual technology costs are dramatically lower now than they were even 10 years ago. And then finally, the fact is that they are in fact providing additional incentives through the, the, the federal legislation. Is that, yeah. Um, how do we balance state 
and subnational powers with federal or national powers, because having powers concentrated at the national government might reduce the risk of states not performing at the expense of impeding certain states from going beyond, especially in the context where national government priorities can change in short period of time. Perhaps like the US, which can switch between Republican and Democratic approach every four years. So the question is, how do we balance state and or subnational power with federal or national powers? Um, because having powers concentrated at the national government might reduce the risk of state not performing at the expense of impeding certain states from going beyond. I think this power is not power related to energy, but it's a it's political, power. political power, right? That's a great question. And, and I think there's two sides, uh, two elements of that question. So first in the US context, I can speak to, I don't, I don't know how the differentiation it happens here as much, but in the US there's, there are definitely, um, I use the term policy authorities. That sounds like a little bit of a technical term, but really what that means is in certain cases, the federal government has authority because of existing laws that allow the federal government to set a level or a standard for everybody, right? And and that happens actually across a lot of different sectors. So for example, just as one example, the federal government has the ability to set a nationwide standard for minimum energy efficiency for a wide range of different kinds of products for like light bulbs, refrigerators, freezers, you know, electric motors, they can set a minimum efficiency standard for everybody in the US because that is an authority granted to the federal government by Congress. So that, that is higher authority than any state authority, just by the way our system works. It, it's higher authority. So that will, that will if, if Texas doesn't have a strong policy on walk-in coolers and freezers and the federal government does, then the federal government wins that discussion. <laughs> like it's our rule. It's the federal government, the national rule. In certain cases, the federal government doesn't necessarily um, able to do that. So, for example, if often if it's the case, if a, if a state wants to set a higher level of standard, they can often do that. Like California can often set a higher standard for, in fact, a lot of states, as I mentioned, can set a higher standard for the renewables mix in the electricity grid. The states are able to do that. There's no national rule for that, by the way. There's no national minimum standard of renewables. But the states can all set one. And many of them have standards of like 30 40% now of minimum renewables. And so states can do that. And that, that's a case where the, the authority by Congress has not been granted. Uh, it's not been taken away from the states. So the states have the ability to do that. So the first answer to your question is that it's a little bit case by case on what the policy area is that you're talking about. And sometimes the federal government has the ability and sometimes the states have more. Um, the other is that uh, I think it was a very good point that was made about the kind of thinking about the longevity of different things. And this is part of why for the US, this all of society strategy actually is a good strategy, I think. Because yes, you do get presidents come and go, right? Like. Some, you know, if you look at not just Trump, who is a particularly difficult president, but like not just him, but like over the last 30 years, we've had Republicans, we've had Democrats, and, and the Republicans have tended to be more, you know, pro-business and a little slower on environmental stuff. Not all the time, but generally, and the Democrats a little more forward on that. Hopefully it's, you know, not as, hopefully we, I, I feel, I always say climate change should be a nonpartisan issue. I wish it were in my country, nonpartisan meaning everybody should agree it's important. <laughs> That's what I think. Um, but right now it's not. Um, the, the, the thing is that as these presidents come and go, the question is how do you in the US context make sure that things keep going? And one of that is to sort of, there are federal regulations that actually do sort of stick through different administrations. So that's one thing that's hard to see, but it does happen. The second thing is the state policies that can be a kind of um, a backstop to the federal if there's a president that comes in and decides you know, to do something different. But again, the way our system works, everything's pretty like, there's a lot of inertia in the US system. And so the fact is that once we get this legislation from Congress this year, it'll actually be hard for a future Congress to like roll it back. They could, but I kind of doubt that they would roll everything back. 
just even if it's Republicans, but I don't know. Anyway, it's a good question and it just sort of underscores the importance of doing all of the above. Thank you. Okay. Any more question? Maybe I have another question because um, we are doing right now with uh, Professor Allen as well uh, to measure land use, um, you know, the MAC, uh, the marginal cost abatement, uh, abatement cost for land use. And especially because we we want to argue that uh, in terms of, in the case of Indonesia, that is maybe the, the least cost compared to electricity, but when I uh, see your presentation, the US really focus more in the electricity transportation building. And is it uh, nothing can be done with the land use or why you did um, uh, electricity as the highest priority compared to land use? That's a great question. This I, I, I think this would be a conversation we should have of what the differences are and I think I would learn a lot from hearing more about what your study is finding on the marginal abatement costs. I'm just curious about that. Um, in the US side, I mean one thing that I think we 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 do know and I think this group would see as you know being very clear difference between the US and Indonesia is Indonesia's got a very much bigger kind of land use component of its economy and also um, emissions. And that's just that the US did doesn't have as much, they just don't have as much forest area relative to the economy in some ways. And so um, when we do our work and we do our studies, you see that there was some land use like emissions benefit there, but I, I, I will underscore that there's still a lot of land in the US that's like absorbing carbon, but in the end, our net benefit from the land use, like it's important to remember when you see that waterfall, I'm just gonna note, it, that's the net change from today. Okay, so like the net change in land use emissions from today is relatively small there. Um, and that doesn't mean it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's the net between the flux out, the emissions part of it and what's absorbed by regrowth of the forests. And so right now that that particular slide just sort of shows that we're kind of holding steady in the US. And that's because of two things. One is some forests have regrown since we basically cleared all the forests in the early 20th century. And that sort of helped, you know, perversely helped our emissions because it's forest regrowing. But we also expect that those forests are going to be degrading because of climate change and increasing like pests and things like that over the next two decades. We expect that they'll be worse off in, in a decade or two. Now, your question was about what can we do to like enhance the sink, right? Like what's the marginal abatement cost of improving, like basically in our case in the US would be planting new trees or expanding forest area. That is still relatively inexpensive honestly. And it's probably one of the least expensive ways we can reduce emissions in the U.S. The thing that we've had a harder time with in the U.S. is the policy mechanism for, for forest expansion, just the way our system works. The way that would largely have to happen is the federal government would have to be paying just money for reforesting. And that kind of strategy is very difficult for our Congress to, to do. Whereas regulating on electricity sector is much easier. They can sort of tell other people what to do, but when they have to, you, everybody's found this with the U.S. in the international climate discussion. When anybody asks the U.S. to take out its wallet and pay for pay for stuff, we're like, no, no thanks. <laughs> so they don't like to pay for anything, and it includes it includes um, our own forests. Like we don't want to pay for our own forests because Congress doesn't want to pay the money for it, but it's fine for them to tell other people to reduce their emissions. So that's. A somewhat unfair to my own country, but like somewhat unfair, like criticism, but like, it's just easier to do it that way in our political system. But there's a lot there, actually, I'd happy to talk more. Is there any question in the zoom? No. No question from you, Fahri? Okay. Okay, then. So thank you so much, Professor Hoffman, for the lecture and for the answers to our questions. And I think we are going to close this uh, lecture if there's no more question. Thank you so much. And thank you.
Maybe just in time, or I don't know. <laughs> just, just in time, maybe. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. When I was the head of the department, we initiated the renovation with the it collaborated with the our man. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right.